Welcome to Destination Manitoba. This week we're heading up to Hecla Island. Grab your toothbrush, pack your bag, and let's hit the road. Surrounded by beautiful Lake Winnipeg, Hecla Island offers a vast array of tourist attractions. The island was established as a provincial park in 1969. Maxine Ingalls grew up on the island. I spoke to her about the history of Hecla and what draws people here. Around the 1870s, Mount Askia uh, was erupting and that was very close to the northeastern part of Iceland, which is where our families came from. And it was that explosion that set ash all over that northeastern part. And what it did is it caused a drought, but it covered the land with ash, which meant that many of the sheep farmers um, just couldn't, couldn't maintain. They had, and they couldn't, they couldn't keep food for them. And even to earn a living for most of those people was, would be very hard. Because as much as people think that the Icelanders who came here were fishermen, most of them were migrant farm workers. So if there was no work for them to do, they had to go to somewhere else. So when the agents came and offered them the possibility of land and, and, and coming to a, a new, you know, new land and land being given by the government to start fresh, many of them grabbed that opportunity because they didn't have it in Iceland. So Nia Islande, or New Iceland, was an actual Icelandic reserve just like you have an Aboriginal reserve, an Indian reserve today or back then. So we were entitled to uh, an area of land that only Icelanders could settle in. No other people group was to settle in this area. There's many reasons why the early Icelandic immigrants came to beautiful Hecla in 1876. And it, it's just a matter of looking around to see how much bounty there is here. There is the beautiful boreal forest, we have limestone quarries here, uh, as well as just the water as well. And the water was very significant for the Icelandic people. We are recreating as much of, as we can. And that's the nice part, is that many of the people who have resettled here are, because we're descendants off the original settlers, we know what it was like here, so we still carry on with a lot of the same traditions. We're trying to learn the language which our parents spoke fluently, but didn't teach us, but we're trying to learn it. What you see behind me is the remnants of the huge dock where the ferry would take people to and from the island. Well, the ferry would go from that lighthouse area, because you could see the cribbing there, to the other cribbing part. It would take about half an hour to come across that little bit. I remember when the ferry came, and the ferry was always a big attraction that the tourists would come. We'd stand on our doorstep. Uh, well, we lived in the, in the trees, so we didn't see the tourists as much, but we would go to my grandfather's, to my obvious place, and we'd stand on the doorstep and watch all the cars go by and wave at every car, and it was wonderful. For the Icelandic settlers, life was full of hardship. Untamed wilderness, harsh winters, and smallpox. What would happen is when, uh, when somebody would have smallpox is that they would go into a coma-like state where their heartbeat slows down and often they would be mistaken for dead and would be buried. And so this was obviously a problem, so they did develop a system where they tied a string around the wrist of the person while in the coffin and then the string would go up through the casket and through the, uh, the soil and would be attached to a bell. And if you do go over to the church, you will see a very old grave uh, site with the bell still attached. So there would be somebody there waiting with a shovel to dig up the, uh, the individual that would uh, wake up. So that's what they, I, we like to say, that's where Saved by the Bell came from and the graveyard shift came from as well. We offer everything that can, uh, that can help contribute to the memories of, of the people that come here. And, uh, and it's pretty incredible as an educator to look out at a campfire and, and see kids having fun and their parents or grandparents engaging with their children. And, and the way I see it, it's, it's a memory-making experience when you come to Hecla. There's something about water that lures people here. 
And as much as there's other activities, it is the water. People want to walk on the beach. They want to, I think people want something that's natural, not man-made, something that they can't control, something that isn't technologically, you know, that you're able to change or that somebody can, can you know, access. It's you and the water. And so I, I, I believe that is the first and number one attraction. There's excellent camping. I know people who have been here for generations. People have, have come there and their children are now camping here. So I do think Gull Harbor Campground offers a, a lot for them to do. But Hecla is not commercialized. So um, there are yacht, you know, people with yachts and boats and things. Again, it comes right back down to the water. It's, it's what does the water pull and draw from you? And so for us, it was definitely coming back here uh, was because we could sit here every day, have our coffee in the morning, and watch the fishermen fish during the fishing season and think, could life get any better than this? And it has to do with the water. Yeah, water speaks peace. Now, I think that for anybody, um, if you're stressed, if you have a lot of things going on, you can go down to the water and sit there and you sense the majesty and the peacefulness and the healing. I, I think there's nothing more healing than water and listening to the water lapping against the rocks. And it's just like it, it's washing away all kinds of things that are in our lives and just takes it and puts it in a proper perspective and just settles your soul. And that, that's where I, to me, it's a real spiritual sense to that. And if you can, if you can see that, then and, and you gravitate towards that, I think you'll get it.